Scott Smart. Hey, it's one. A very good morning to you. It's me, Scotty McClue. And we are, of course, live on the country's top radio station. The big one, Scotland's number one. The one everyone's talking about. The one everyone is listening to. Local radio for Scotland. Local radio for Lanarkshire. And local radio for you. A very, very good morning to you. And, of course, an excellent thing happening this morning. Yes, it's a Scotty McClue special. The McClue interview. And I have in the studio with me someone I can only really describe as a great man. Man. A great Scot and uh, a great worldly wise gentleman. Now, he didn't know I was going to say any of this, of course, and uh, there's no chance of swelling his head. I can tell you that right now. He's uh, Scotland's top football agent and Europe's top football agent. I would say actually the world's top football agent, but you don't hear that from him. This is the interesting thing. I had to do my research and find that out. And of course, he's represented hundreds and hundreds of our top football players over the years also great personages in the shape of uh, George Best and many many others who he uh, probably doesn't even tell us about but uh, people in the know will be in the know so there we are he's uh, a man who's also uh, never shied away from controversy or controversy in his life and uh, he's also a man who's brought great harmony in his life uh, he's uh, a man who um, covers worlds of uh, football worlds of politics and worlds of religion. These are things we don't talk about, of course, but this morning I think we'll give them a right good shake-out and find out what is what. He is Bill McMurdo. Good morning, Bill. Morning, Scotty. How are you? Very well, sir. Very nice to hear you. That's better. Can you hear yourself now? I can indeed, it yes. Is, and I can hear you as well, so that's great, you see. And they've told me not to touch any of the switches, by the way. You know. I can understand why. <laughs> We've got millions of pounds worth of the latest digital equipment, and they put an old fool in charge of it, you know, so there we are. Excellent stuff. Now, Bill, um, let's... Can we go back to the start, how this great journey began? Because, uh, you know, you're a lad of peats, as Rabbi Burns would say. You're a man of many parts. Uh, you're, you're a man of great charm. And uh, you're known in so many different circles throughout the world. The world of football, the world of politics, the world of religion. So, you know, there's just so much to get through and so little time to do it in. So can we go back to where it started? You're a Scotsman. Yes. And are you from the west of Scotland? Or? I'm actually from Edinburgh, oh. and, and I would profess to be British rather than Scottish. Oh, right. I'm British first and Scottish second. Very, very proud to be a Scot, even more proud to be British. Yep. So, so I mean, well, we're getting into the politics right away there, Bill, but, well, but, you know... I thought that was apolitical, but That was go. absolutely apolitical, but I think at the moment it is, it is uh, political in that it's a very, very hot topic, this whole Scottish-British thing. Yes. Let's, let's start there, then, since you've, since you've uh, opened, the, opened the, 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 the bowling there with that one. At the moment, what do you think of all this that's happening with independence in Scotland? Are you a, a nationalist, or you're, you're, you're obviously a unionist, I would have said, really. No, I'm, I'm a unionist, 100% unionist, always have been. Uh, it frightens me to think that we could even consider independence. Obviously, um, I would go along with the, the majority, but I hope that if it comes, it's years and years down the road, because I don't think we're ready for it yet. Right. I think the very fact that the banks collapsed in the last couple of weeks would indicate that we're far from ready for Scotland. These are very old banking institutions, oh, aren't they? Back 400 years, 500 years, things like that, and, and bang, yes. all gone. gone. I wonder, though, just to what extent all this is... I mean, I can't believe that the world goes wrong in, in 24 hours. No, you I, know, I so agree with you. This has been coming for some time, and I, I'm also quite interested in the way that the present left-wing socialist government yes. in this country um, have... Uh, tried to shy clear of it and said, oh, this has just happened, it's come down upon our heads, it's not as if we've been planning it for years and years. And I mean, I've actually watched Gordon Brown over the last 11 years draw up uh, this, I mean, we could have told him this was coming. Well, what about his famous cry, no more boomer bus times? No on, we're on level footing. And it's never been worse. I mean, in the last 60 years, absolutely atrocious. You have to blame Gordon Brown, he was the Chancellor, as you know. You have to blame Tony Blair, you have to blame Alistair Darling. Uh, and the whole uh, Labour left is just terrible. Do, do you think people would think more of these people if, if they actually stood up and said, well, look, we've tried 
our best to redistribute wealth. Yes. And we, we have brought the capitalist system to its knees. Uh, we're, we're, we're not too ashamed of that yeah. because we're socialists. We yeah. wanted to see if we could wreck the shop. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we think we may have done this. Would, it, would we think more of them if they stood up and said that rather than said, oh, I think America's to blame for this? Well, I think they should be honest, but they've never been honest all during the last 10, 11 years. I mean, Tony Blair told stories, lies about Iraq, his missus told stories to Parliament and different people, and, and the whole thing revolves around the fact that they, they've been telling lies from day one, mm -hmm. and, and it's now having serious effects on the economy and serious effects on the British way of life. I accept it's a global problem, but it's a global problem. But I think that we more than, than did our part to, to cause the problem. To cause the problem. Yeah. Well, as my granny would say, you can be aware of a thief but not a liar. That's it. You know, and, and uh, I think I was hearing the other day that Cherie Blair was saying that she reckoned that Tony um, was up there with Churchill. Absolute disgrace. What a, what a thing to say. I mean, you're talking about night and day here. Mm. Chalk and cheese. There's absolutely no way that he could ever be compared with, with Churchill. I mean, it was interesting when, when they said... Uh, how history will judge us. Yes. But I don't think history will remember them. Well, hope not. Mm. From that point of view. So, so there we are. But that's that's what's that, and that's apolitical what we're saying here. I mean, I have to totally. stress that. Totally. This is, so so off, these are the, off the wall. Off the wall. These are the facts of life. Yes. So, so there we are. So going back to, uh, I mean, I'm not going to question your age because I don't know what age you are. You're something of a Peter Pan. I've right. got you. You're certainly into your 40s. I've got as far as that. But when I go back to uh, the other days, you um, were, of course, very famous in London in the 60s, yes, and were to a certain extent the, the sixth Beatle. Well, really, you know, very, very kind of you to say so. Okay. I mean, so, so I've got you now. So you must have just been in your early teens at the time. But uh, I was you, a laddie, as you say. I was just a laddie. You're a laddie. Now you've met you've met absolutely everybody that yes. one could hope to meet in show business. Um, all the big names. We'll not we'll not drop all the big names, but but you've met them all. All the top singers, all the top performers, interviewers, journalists, and of course you were George Best's agent. Yes, uh, for a long time. Fourteen years. Fourteen, 14 years. years. 14 years, 14 right? years with George. Yes. Now, uh, George was obviously a, a, a remarkable character. He was a tremendous guy. He was a great footballer. He was remembered rightly so for his footballing talent, but what a great person he was. He, he was just great fun. I travelled all over the world with him on numerous occasions, and it was just an experience, a tremendous experience. People say to me, well, you know, I had problems with drinking, yes, and I had a lot of problems with him, but for every bad time I had with him, I had a thousand good times, so I, I can't complain. Yes, I would imagine if somebody is drinking heavily yes. uh, uh, in any situation, then if you're close and you're managing them, yes. you've also got to manage that particular situation. Well, that's it. I mean, I, I was aware of it when I took him on board. Um, he never tried to disguise the fact that he had problems with drink, and uh, over the years, we had great periods. At times he went six months without a drink, and then he went on the bevy for six months at a time. But no, great, absolutely great times. Very, very sad what happened to him. But he always said to me that if he lived till he was 40, he would be doing well. And of course he lived till he was 60. He was, a, he, was a, he was a charming, charming oh, man. Absolute, absolute charmer. Mm -hmm. um, the, everyone that met him uh, had a good word to say about him. And I think that that's the mark of a good man. Do you think that, uh, I mean, the the drinking, the addictive personality was more of a, a genetic inheritance or something rather than George himself? It wasn't the football that put him under the, that kind of pressure, really? I think there was a bit of pressure there from the football and the fact that he was actually regarded as the fifth Beatle. I mean, he was the first commercial footballer, if you like, and, yeah. and, and he, he transcended everything, show business, movies, the whole bit. And he always maintained, his, his mum was an alcoholic, I think she died when she was about 46, and uh, he used to say that he was of the opinion that it was part genetic, he thought that. But he did, on numerous occasions, try to fight it. I mean, I used to go to Norway with him two and three times a year, and he used to get antibuse tablets implanted mm -hmm. in his stomach. And they would work for maybe two or three months, and then if he decided that uh, he wanted to drink again, he would just take them out. He was also, he, he was, and I say this as a red-blooded male, he was a stunning-looking man. 
We don't like yourself. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a stunning yeah. looking man. And, you know, the women used to fall at his feet. I mean, my mother was a very proper lady, but she, she thought maybe, maybe he was a little bit scruffy with his, with his hair and his beard at the time for, for, for uh, yes. you know, 60s Britain. Yes. And people used to say, ah, scruffy character, that best, you know, and, and all the rest of it. But he was, he was an outstanding sportsman and, and a stunning looking guy. I mean, you know, the girls used to fall at his feet. You know, oh, George Beston. Mm -hmm. which, which teenage Lassie did not have a picture of George Best in her bedroom. Well, unbelievable. I mean, he tells a story that he went out with three Miss Worlds and never turned up for three. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, in my opinion, he, he was one of the best Kent faces in Britain, if not Europe. Everywhere he travelled with them, all the Japanese used to pile off the planes and all the rest of it in Dubai and places like that and take photographs of them instantly, just recognise them straight away. To what extent, Bill, was he... Um going along with the Beatles on the Beatles train just at that time because Britain had it come through the war, there was austerity living and everything and then along came these four bright young men who sang a totally different type of music Aye. and then along came George who played a totally different kind of football. Aye. It was very much his own man. Uh, I don't think it, it was influenced by the Beatles at all but I'll tell you a lovely story. Him and I arrived in Hong Kong one night, we just arrived and the phones never stopped ringing. So I'm, I'm blocking all the calls, as you can imagine. I get this call, this guy says, hey, George, please. I said, uh, can I say who's calling? He went, just get me on the phone, will you? I said, uh, well, not until you tell me who you are. He said, it's Richard Starkey. So I said, George, there's a guy, Richard Starkey. He says he knows you. He says, Bill, that's Ringo Starr. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and they just arrived. They just come into Hong Kong from Australia. And uh, him and his wife took George and I out to dinner that night. So that was my introduction to one of the Beatles. <laughs> to one of the Beatles, yeah. And and you've you've met everybody really. Mostly, I yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mainly I would say through George and uh, through the association with George because everybody loved them, film stars, T V stars, uh Parky, Michael Parkinson, Billy Conley, all these guys just, just love them and love to be seen in his company. Now, you're my agent. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I declare an interest here, and uh, you and I have spent many wonderful years as well in, in the company of the great and the good. Yes. And you've introduced me to, to, to that high-flying world. Yes. And what struck me is that there's very, very little blowharding yes. in that world. Yes, that's true. Every, everybody sits down and maybe have a wee chat about how the missus is. And, and I think what the only concern that the big stars have is that they're secure in your company. Yes. What they say stays within, within that so circle. There's got to be a certain element of trust um, in the first place because too many times they get exposed to people who tell mm. stories and things like that. So, yeah, you have to win their trust in the first instance. But once you've done that, it's great. But all the people I've met um, from whatever background, successful people, to me, they've always been very humble in themselves. So you couldn't meet a more humble guy than George Best. Mm -hmm. And yet he knew about his talents, he knew about his ability, he knew about the effect he had on women and men, I have to ask. Have to suggest, but then. Did, did that upset him in, in some way? I mean, I, I, I worked in theatre in the early days, and there were one or two good-looking guys, and one of them was in floods of tears one night because women wouldn't leave him alone. Well, that was true with George. I mean, wherever you went, there were, there were always a trail of women on the phone writing letters and, you know, outside the house. He lived with me in Arlington for two years, and numerous occasions we'd go out in the morning and at night and there'd be women just waiting in the bushes to, to speak to him in the whole bit. It was, it was, it was, Are you like, sure they weren't yeah. waiting to speak to you? <laughs> well, it was unreal. It really was unreal. But it, it just had that effect. I mean, mm -hmm. and everyone, even guys, used to say, oh, well, my wife loves George best, and can she get her photograph taken and all the rest of it? And they seemed to think it was great that their wife really fancied them. And, and never any, <laughs> never any kind of, were you looking at my missus oh, there? Well, we've got a few of that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's very tempting, isn't it, to say, looking at your missus, you know, not that bad, you know? <laughs> uh, yes, he, he was accused of all different things at oh. different times, you know, but uh, crazy. And did, it, was, was it uh, sometimes, I mean, the pressure on you at times must have been quite immense when, when every newspaper and every television and radio company were, were chasing stories about George. Well, this is it. I mean, uh, most of the time, my job was twofold, uh, and on... One aspect, I was trying to get them into the papers for all the right reasons, and then the, the second 
mm-hmm. situation. I try to keep them out of the papers <laughs> because there were so many things happening. And of course, everything, once the story started, it just grew legs yeah. and it was just amazing. And did you, so did you have journalists saying, we believe also this has happened? Did you say, oh no, come on? <laughs> Always tried to not tell lies. Right? Because that, that comes back and bites your bum, as you can imagine. Yep. But it's a very, very difficult road to travel. You know, you're trying to keep George happy on the one side and, and all the press and the media on the other side. To what extent is it important for somebody when they are famous through their talent to um, be there to do all the public relations side of things as well? Because there must have been occasions where you said, George, we're we've been invited to go on BBC television tonight and he was thinking, well, I'm the one to do that. I'd rather have a wee drink with my friends, if you don't mind. I'll tell you an absolute story. The, a good friend of his, a guy called Jack Trickett, has a hotel in Stockport. And he said to me one night, he said, look, I want to do a testimonial dinner for George's, which was around about 1984 or something. Um, we'll do everything. The Man United, the whole football team will be there, etc., etc. 600 people, is it okay? And I said, spoke to George about it. I thought, this is tremendous, tremendous. So him and I are in the flat in London on the, the day of the, the dinner. And uh, I spoke to Jack Trickett in the afternoon. And he, he said, I'll see you at six o'clock. I said, okay. So George and I left three o'clock, went into a wine bar that we had in London at the time. And he said to me, uh, I'm going to get my hair cut. I said, well, I'll come with you. He went, no, no. He says, uh, give me ten minutes then, come round. I went round, he'd gone done a runner. Now the guy Jack Trickett had said to me, if George comes tonight, think about it, 1984 we will give him a £100,000 testimonial right, in his hand, a £100,000 so George knew this and I eventually caught up with him about half an hour after it and he said, uh, I'm not going. I said, what do you mean you're not going? He said, I'm not going. I don't want to go to Manchester. I said, George is a minimum of £100,000. He said Bill, what don't you understand? I don't want to go. <laughs> I said, well, what's the problem? Is it because we're going by a train? Should we maybe fly or should we get a limo? Or... He went, no, well, I just don't want to go. I said, but you're going to let down all these people. or 600 people paid good money, etc., etc. And I just couldn't budge him. Right. Nothing I could say or do would convince him that he should have been in Manchester that night. Did he get tired of it at times? Was he getting Aye. weary of all the... Yes, he did, because it was constant. Yeah. Constant. I mean, he couldn't walk down the street. 24-7, really, isn't it? Every time he walked down the street, he'd get stopped for autographs and photos and, and the whole bit, you know. And it, you, you still get that, I've noticed. Uh, I, don't, I don't walk down the street with you now, because it takes yeah. hours. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Bill, who are you signing the day? Yeah. And all that stuff. Uh, Bill McMurder, it's, it's wonderful. If you've just joined us, folks, and you're wondering what on earth's going on on Scotland's top radio station, it's uh, Scotty McClue, in, uh, the Scotty McClue interview, a Scotty McClue special. I've got my guest in the studio this morning is none other than Bill McMurdo, uh, who uh, modestly is uh, uh, Europe's top football agent, but in actual fact, I would say, is the world's top football agent. So uh, we're going to be taking some calls. Bill's with us uh, for about another 40 minutes, and we're going to take some calls as well. Uh, So there you are. It'll give you a chance to ring in on 01698 337 107 and speak directly to... The world's top football agent, Bill McMurdo. Back after this. Queen's fastest growing radio station. Call our team on 01698 303 420. That's 01698 303 420. L107, the right choice for you. Manic says L107. L107. Right, this is L107, of course, Scotland's top radio station, Scotland's number one, the big one, the one that everyone is talking about and the one everyone is listening to. Uh, it's a Scotty McClue special this morning, the McClue interview, and we have in the studio the world's top football agent, Bill McMurdo, a nicer man you could not meet. How are you doing, Billy? Quite comfy there? I'm, I'm very comfy. I've got a nice week. Look, did you get an in-flight <laughs> meal and everything? <laughs> 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 the lot. <laughs> Talking you, of in-flight... You spared no expense. Oh, no expense spared here at L107, I'll tell you that. <laughs> we could run out to the chuck wagon and get you anything you need. What I was going to say to you... Um, I just mentioned there, just happened to mention, in-flight meals. But you must have flown thousands upon thousands and thousands of miles around the world yes. uh, in, in, in your time. I mean, have, have you enjoyed it all? I've enjoyed my life. I mean, I've had an absolutely fantastic time. I don't enjoy the flying. I don't enjoy airports and all the security nonsense and yeah. the whole bit. 
Um, but it's a part and parcel of the job. If you want to do the job, then you have to be prepared to travel. Let's let's look at the the football agency side of it. I mean, you don't don't just look after one or two players, do you? You must look after a, a fair number. I've got a fair number. Right. So you you wouldn't like to indicate just how many, no? I would reckon about seventy. Seventy players you're looking. At. That's that's a pretty heavy workload. For a man in his certainly in his late forties, <laughs> the Peter the Peter Pan here forty five plus VAT. forty five <laughs> plus a bit of that there, <laughs> fantastic. I mean that's that's quite a workload. Uh, you've no interest in slowing down with your workload, obviously. Not at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate health wise, and I can keep going. I still play football mm -hmm. three times a week. And oh my yes. Wife, my wife says I'm Peter Pan because yeah. I keep doing that. But it keeps you fit, and it, and yeah, it keeps Peter you young. Pan. You're not carrying any weight or anything <laughs> like that, and you've got no attitude of a, a, a more senior person about you here. No. There's, there's still that twinkle in the oh, eye. <laughs> I try hard to keep it that way. I suspect you're up for nonsense, Bill McMurdo. Oh, totally. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, um, George being from Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you were over there working with George in the... Uh, we'll just carry on with George if that's all sure, right, because right, people are still fascinated by this legend. Um... You were over there with George in the 60s, 70s, 80s, yeah. 90s, so that was quite a period of turmoil in, in, in Northern yes. Irish history. Yes. Um, to what extent did that overspill into football and into to, to your world? Well, it had quite an impact on it altogether, particularly in George's case, because George had a, a cousin who was murdered by the IRA. Right. And there was, in fact, a death threat on him at one stage, which was taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. It was like a coded death threat. And uh, I couldn't see that happening because I, I just wouldn't think they would do that to George because they, 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 the people all over Ireland regard him as their son. He yes. is an Ulsterman. He was an Ulsterman. Um, but the whole of Ireland uh, were George's best fans. He had a tremendous reception every time he went over there. Absolutely great reception. Uh, but he he was very aware of the whole situation. He was brought up in a loyalist area. He was brought up in, in East Belfast, lived there all his days. His father lived there until very recently when he passed away. And, I mean, George was uh, fully familiar with, with the whole situation. Mm -hmm. What was the... Latterly, what was the conflict still about in Ireland? Well, we had a situation, I believe, that um, they... The loyalist people wanted to stay within the United Kingdom, and the nationalist people wanted a united Ireland. I mean, that, that's it in a, in a nutshell. And uh, I don't think that's changed, mm -hmm. uh, even although we have the peace at the moment, and I'm glad we have the peace, yeah. because we had enough problems for 30-odd years. Um, but I, I think it's an unholy peace in a lot of ways. I think it could go at any given time. It could start away again. On an on easy piece. The only thing is the economy is so good. I mean, the economy, if, if, if Britain and Scotland were having quite an austere time up until the 60s, 70s, yes. surely Northern Ireland was having, you know, that's multiplied. Well, Northern Ireland always had problems with unemployment, high rates of unemployment for both Protestants and Catholics, I have to say. And uh, that situation has changed for the better recently. And, and it's great to go over there now. I go over maybe six times a year, and it's really good to go over there. Uh, and the climate's changed altogether. Mm -hmm. You're not afraid to go here or go there or whatever. And that's great. That, that's a and the economy's uh, healthy. Uh, very healthy. And, of course, yeah. Irish people and Northern Irish people are great, fun people in general, aren't they? There's Absolutely tremendous. Tremendous people. They, they just enjoy life. Yes. I, I mean, I know it's maybe hard to say that with what they went through for 30-odd years, both sides I'm talking about, but they, they, they make you very, very welcome, and they're very hospitable. Do you not think where there have been big, great swathes of working-class people, there's always an underlying humour there, whether it's, it's mines or steel or shipbuilding? See, I think that's the answer to it, Scotty, uh, is to, to treat it with a, a great deal of humour. Mm -hmm. Because I think that once you introduce humour and fun and all the rest of it, it takes a sting out of things. Mm -hmm. Now, all this carry on recently about... Because there has been genuine suffering throughout the oh, Industrial Revolution yes. with, with, with ordinary folk, hasn't yes. there? Oh, yes. I mean, we've all suffered. Real we've discomfort. All, yes. We've all, we've all suffered over the peace. And uh, it, it's good to see things improving. Not only in Northern Ireland, but obviously here too. I mean, we've had a good time in, in so many ways. 
you could argue up until the last 10 years but things uh, in, in particular as you know over over the last decade uh, seemed to be going well but everyone knew that the bubble had to burst. Uh, the something. bubble has to burst it can't be going well I think this is where I admired Margaret Thatcher because to a certain extent I mean you had uh, Macmillan with his wind of change blowing through Africa and the decolonialization of Britain you had uh, which which I don't think was particularly well handled whether you even go right back to 1948 in the Middle East yes. or uh, uh, 1962 and 1963 in, in Kenya and yeah. Tanganyika and Uganda the British have not been particularly good at, at handling their get out no you know, and, and I believe, rightly or wrongly, that they probably sold this country down the river at the time. Well, I, uh, I think we sold <coughs> ourselves short. Sold right? ourselves oh, short. Yes, and how uh, I had the good fortune to meet uh, Margaret Thatcher on two occasions, and I found her to be remarkable in a lot of ways. She made a, a massive mistake with this poll tax, the way that it was presented and the whole bit, and, and she's going to have to live with that. For all life. So much of it is presentation, there oh, wasn't yes, it? Yes, and how. I mean, well, she, she mishandled that. That was a bad PR call, it was bad publicity. She's never ever got over that, but she was she was a tremendous person to do business with her. I did a thing with her in 1982, and, and she financed a trip to, to America then, and it, it was tremendous. And, and we had all the British consulate um, all over America at our disposal, and uh, just she couldn't have done enough for us. And uh, that was good. I think she should have got you to handle the aftermath of the poll tax. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> it's, the, it's the Tommy Sheridan. <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's the tidying up afterwards, isn't it? Yeah. But, but you had Wilson with his white heat of technology, yeah. but none of them grasped the nettle and said, look, we're going to have to cut down the shipyards, we're going to have to cut down the mines, we're going to have to cut down the steelworks. We can't go on subsidising. Well, that's it. I mean, the peculiar thing recently, you, that Tony Blair came out in favour of Margaret Thatcher, didn't he? in the last two or three weeks. Well, I heard that he, she was instrumental in his appointment because she'd, she'd said Tony was a patriot. Aye. Um, I don't know if he is. I think Gordon Brown is a patriot. Mm -hmm. you know, I think if he's got many faults, the very fact that he's got this Britishness and he wants to do everything yes. and promote Britain, Yes. I, I could certainly... Uh, support them on that one you know to what extent i mean it, it, i find it very interesting that uh, sorry to, to draw you in politics here bill but i find it very interesting that alex salmond um shouted from the rooftops about independence yes. and now that you're i mean two things one i feel that if you had independence then that you don't need a nationalist party yes so you could kiss them goodbye yes. but um you, you you've got alex salmond there now uh, the fact that we've got our separate parliaments, I mean, obviously you never want to separate the crowns. Yeah. Um, again, that would be a piece of nonsense, but he's gone very, very quiet yes. on independence yes. and gone very quiet about the oil and, and everything. So is that a case of we've already arrived or is that a case of I don't think this will really work, we have to call Canny now? No, I think he be careful what you wish for. That's it. He beat the drum to start with, didn't he? Now he realised it's just not going to happen. I don't think it will happen. Uh, a strange one, I think it was one day I was with you that I, I met Alex Hammond in Glasgow at a dinner and he said to me um, that he would be very keen to have me as his PR man. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't know... A, a wise man, he's got up in my estimation. I don't know if he was kidding or not, but I said to him, well, how could I possibly... I mean, I've been a unionist all my days, how could I possibly... This was before he was the First Minister. Uh, he was a big jambo, you know, he was a big football man and the whole bit. But oh, he, he, was, he was quite keen. He obviously realised that I've, I've been out and about for the last couple of years. And you seem to think I could maybe do a job for them. Well, I think I think you could do an excellent job for, for any of them. It's it's really how you want to spend your time, Bill. That's uh, that's what I think is important now. I mean, there's 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 lots of important work to be done out there politically because politics at the moment um, are not held in high regard by the young people of this country. Well, you know the situation was about 1985, I believe, 1984. Um, I actually defected from the Tory Party, and. Uh, caused a few problems for Margaret Thatcher as it so harmed at that particular time. We started a unionist party here, Scottish Unionist Party, and it had a tremendous impact because we, we decided that we were going to target all the Tory seats whereby they, they didn't have large uh, boundaries, they didn't have large, uh, what's the word I'm for? Areas, uh, large, uh, constituencies. Uh, 
it didn't have large majorities, that's what A large reach, yeah, a large so, majority. So yeah. we went for all those, and, and I heard on good authority um, afterwards that um, that's when the Conservative Party here got annihilated. And a lot of people within the party, uh, within the Tory party, said it was down to us actually, you know, defecting and, and making a noise and doing the whole bit. Tremendous coverage we got in the space of about a year, 18 months, and uh, it brought them to heel in a lot of ways. But now, it's, it's, we certainly lost out in Scotland after that. It's quite difficult because, I mean, I was brought up, Scotland had a very strong conservative and unionist yeah. party. Alec Douglas Hume. Oh, sure. Was the uh, was the prime minister yes. at the time? Cold stream and uh, uh, Michael Noble, secretary of state for Scotland. Willie Ross yes. was the the Labour secretary of state. Yes. Uh, George Younger at yes, the age of, of thirty four, right. um, uh, a conservative. So the conservatives were very very strong, very powerful. James yes. Gould, yes. Uh, latterly, and Lord Gould, and yes. uh, th they were very powerful in Scotland at the time. Uh, now, and Edward Heath used to come up regularly as as, as prime minister. He was very pro Scot. I would have said. I think one of the problems as to why they lost their effect up here was that they, they did away. They were, in fact, as you said, the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. And someone in their wisdom decided to drop the Unionist bit. Ah. And accordingly, they lost a lot of support, I believe, because of that. Would it, would it strengthen their case now if they came back with it? I would think so. I mean, I, I think the country is, is ready for a change. I'm not sure that David Cameron's a man to, to lead the Tory party, but if you then say, well, if it's not him, who do you get? And there's not, there's not a lot of choices, really. Well, I, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you, you laugh at me for this, but uh, I, I'm a bit of a fan of Boris Johnson's. I love him. I, love him. <laughs> I, I absolutely I just, love him. I could him. do business with Boris Johnson, well, you know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you how, how much I like Boris Johnson. <laughs> I have a flat in London, as you know, and I was tempted to, to make that my main dwelling so I could vote for him as the mayor. Well, you, you, you call it a flat, but it's more like the, the, the top row of a street, really, isn't it? <laughs> no, I, I think Boris is, is just tremendous. He, I think he's so full of fun in the whole bit. Yeah, I just love him. I think speech. that should be the approach to politics. We need some fun. What's, what's concerning me, you've got your, your British Conservative yeah. and Unionist Party, effectively. Mm -hmm. Let's just call it that for now. How does this tie in with Europe? Because I'm actually a little bit wary of the bureaucracy of Europe. I'm not convinced it's healthy for Britain. I think it's the worst thing that's happened to Britain. I, I think that we should be out of Europe tomorrow. I mm -hmm. don't think we should ever go with the euro at all. Because um, it's creeping up, isn't oh, it? It's going to be shocking. one pound per euro soon, isn't it? Absolutely shocking. But we shouldn't be in Europe. I mean, we're going to give up our sovereignty and the whole bit. Uh, and it's just... That just eating away at us on a daily basis and the, the sooner that the people in Britain we, I mean how can Tony Blair say he's going to give us a referendum on Europe and then decide against it mm -hmm. then you get Ireland with the referendum and then they decide against it and then they decide that the, the, the Irish people should maybe have to do it again and make sure that they vote for it. Do you think case. this has all been decided at oh. European level really and they're, they're, they've yes. got a disrespect yes. for, for the local yes. side of things, yes. for Westminster yes. and for Holyrood? We, we would lose everything, everything that's dear to us we mm -hmm. would lose it because of the European Union and we just shouldn't be in it. I mean they're coming in here with the, the truckloads and, and we can't stop them. All the immigrants coming in from all the European countries, taking up the jobs a whole bit. Do, do you trust the Sorry. idea that this is this is this is stopping though? That they're beginning to panic now. That, that this is going to cause massive problems yeah. within our country. It's already caused the problem. And um, what they're doing now, trying to stop it or at least reduce it, it's not going to have any effect at all because they're all here. And These still, are economic migrants. They aren't yeah, there. They're yes. not asylum seekers no, no, or refugees no. or anything. This is economic migrancy. I know, and in addition to that, what about all the legal immigrants that come in here? Mm -hmm. the guys that come here on holiday and never go home and things like that, it's just absolutely Well, I was, I, I was hearing that uh, a lot of the priests yeah. in Edinburgh are very happy because it shoved up the, uh, oh. the turnout at Mass. And how? Well, they reckon for the first time since the Reformation that you now have more Catholics going to church than what you have Protestants in Scotland because of the Polish immigrants in particular. <laughs> Yes. Never discuss football, politics or religion. We're doing all three this morning, of course. It's a Scotty McClue special, the McClue interview on Lanarkshire's L107, the country's top radio station. My honoured and esteemed guest this morning is the world's top football agent, Mr Bill McMurdo. More from Bill after this. Straight through. Um, I'm conscious that time is always tight. I mean, I could talk to you for hours and the rest of it, you know, but uh, uh, you've got so many things to do and it's very much appreciated you coming in to join us today. Um, do you... Uh, 
L let's just tackle the whole sectarian thing with football, because I think that's a very important point to look at at the moment. Now, you used to have all the, the songs and the chants and everybody stamping, and, and in particular an old film game. Yes. Um, now, Jack McConnell came in and thought, this, this must stop. Um, and you can't but help think, well, yes, because it, it, it was getting a bit out of hand at times, you know, and, and on one or two occasions people had been uh, murdered. Yes. Uh, th through sectarianism, and I mean, in many occasions, of course, people have been murdered through sectarianism. Do Do you think that it's a cosmetic exercise, or do you think Jack McConnell's work has managed to eradicate a lot of the problems within football? No, I don't think so at all. I think it was, in fact, cosmetic. I, I don't think it did any good whatsoever. Um, you have a situation that uh, you have bigotry and sectarianism in Scotland, mm -hmm. and in my opinion, it's been reduced over the years. And I think that, that that can only be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But you're always going to have it to a certain degree because of the way the system is here, because of the structure. Everyone says that you have problems with segregated schools. I really believe that. I genuinely believe that all kids should go to the same school. How can you have kids playing in the street up to their five-year-old and then you tell them that there's a difference and some's got to go to this school and some's got to go to that no, school? No, I wondered, I'd actually said to the nation that I wondered if we should franchise our education to the Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, because the, the, the sort of standard of discipline and, and what have you, no. but not actually have the religious side of it pushed. Yes, well, a lot of people uh, suggest that we shouldn't have any religion at all in schools. I don't know if that's a good uh, thing or a bad thing. I don't think so. I mean, the power superior to mankind is God. Let's yes. have it straight. Whatever yes. you want to call that power, uh, I would say God is yeah. the name, even if you were looking at good orderly yeah. discipline. Yes. Um, and I, I think children need to realise that they are not the superior power in the world. Well, that's it. I, I think that it's, it's essential, it's imperative that we do have religious education and religious instruction mm -hmm. in schools, whether it's Catholic or Protestant or whatever. I think that kids need a faith behind them. Mm -hmm. And the very fact that the schools are not doing that now, not to the same extent as when you and I were at school. They're not, in fact, educating the children all the lot, yeah. They're not educating. I mean, I, I, I see that even with my own grandkids. Mm -hmm. Some of their views on life are just, you know, totally alien to everything that I believed in. And it, it's only because of Everyone should be PC and this, that, and the next thing. I, I think we've just lost a I don't think PC no. is PC, though. No. You see, I think PC itself is, is, is insulting. We've completely lost the plot. It's mm. as simple as that. And that's a European thing again. Oh, of course. Of course. It's come into yes. our culture. Yes. I mean, you can't see this and you can't call people that. Yeah, I spend a lot of my time in England, as you know. And over the years, people have regarded me and referred to me as being a mad jock. I never ever took offence at that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm proud to be Scottish, and if they called me a Scotty, or whatever the case may be, that would, uh, how can you take offence? I mean, uh, I've got a pal well, you can here. Never, got, you can never actually give offence, you can only take it. I've got a pal here who's got a Indian restaurant in Hamilton, the spice up the road there, and every time I introduce him to somebody, he says, hello, I'm Aki the Paki. Now, how do you argue with that? That's him saying that he thinks this is absolutely tremendous. Tremendous, yes. And we would never ever take offence at it. And I think that there were too much detail on things like that. It's it? like uh, in the comedians. Remember Charlie Williams? Ah, Charlie used to always Charlie. say his dad was yeah. a colour sergeant in the Black Watch and all <laughs> yes. that sort of stuff. Charlie, right? Charlie's an ex-footballer too, of course, but he's a tremendous Great guy. Charlie. Great guy. We've got somebody on the line. I'll just check who it is. Hello? Hello? Who, who's that? It's Billy Scotty. Billy from Wishy. Yes. You, you want a wee word with Bill McMurdo? Yes, I do, thanks. Bill, that's Billy from Wishy on the phone. How are you, Billy? How are you doing, Bill? I'm well, I'm well, thanks. You? Right, I've got a wee boy to pick with you, Bill. Go on. I just can't understand why you didn't get George Best to sign for the Rangers. Well, I'll tell you what, it was perhaps a lot closer than what you'd ever imagined, Billy. Yeah? Yes, the, the man that really stopped at that stage, at the final stage, the 11th hurdle, was uh, Jack Gillespie. All right. He didn't think that George was fit enough to play for Rangers, but it was his... He had a burning desire to play with Rangers. Was this at the end of his Aye, when, it, when I, I sold him to Hibs. Yeah. He very nearly uh, signed for Rangers round about that period. I'd love to see him in the Rangers jersey. Can you imagine it? Yeah. Aye, aye, tremendous. The other thing is, Bill, I would also like to thank you for the whole Morris Johnson thing. This has not all come out yet. There have been a lot of lies told about Morris Johnson and, and, sure. the, and the, the transfer itself. Aye. And you know the real story. I would, maybe you could actually tell the, the people the right truth. Well, there's been much written and said about it over the pieces you can imagine. Yes. 
at the time when it became known and went public on it, I said to a specific reporter, I said, look, I, I don't have any problems because Morris will give any club that he plays for a hundred percent. Of course, it was then said that I had said that the only club that he ever wanted to play for was Rangers, and, and that just wasn't the case. But I thought Morris was, uh, all the guys I looked after, he was probably one of the most complete footballers and prolific goal scorers I ever worked with, and a lovely wee guy. And uh, after all these years, it's, what, 19 years now since he signed for Rangers. After all these years, I've not had one regret. And I have to say that most of the Rangers support that I come into contact with all the time, they, st they seem to think it was, looking back, that it was a tremendous breakthrough for the club. Yes. Well, what I'd like to say is you changed history then, Bill, actually. Yes. That yes. was history changing. It wasn't just a football player signing for Rangers. No, that's it. I mean, we, we changed the whole way of life. We never ever got the credit for what we did at the time because a lot of people thought it was done for the wrong reasons. Yes. Everyone thought it was done to, to sort of stick it up Celtic, if you like. Yeah. Uh, that that wasn't the case. I mean, uh, Graham Sooners bought Morris Johnson because he believed he was a world-class striker, and he proved to be the case. Could you tell me, you know Graham Sooners pretty well, Aye. but do you know him as well as anybody? Do you, do you think that Graham Sooners is really a top-class manager? Yes, I do, and and I honestly believe that Graham Sooners should have had the Scotland job when George Burley got it. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to come on. That's what I was going to say. I think they got the, gave the wrong man the job oh, there. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. Um, Graham Sooners is a far, far better manager, a far better coach than than George Burley. Do, I just, do I you just think, think it was a bad poor thing that this? The excuse was that Graham didn't want to come up to Scotland. That's rubbish, by the way. I, I don't believe that to be the case. I, I, I genuinely don't know, but I don't believe that to be the case. He's very, very passionate about his football, Graham. And, I mean, he went to Turkey, didn't he? He went to Galatasaray yeah. and, and all. But, and obviously, um, if he'd got the job, I'm sure if it was a condition that he, he lived up here, then I'm sure he would have done that. See the way people struggling now anyway, but what, that sounds rubbish anyway, because you get a point any time of the day, you know what I mean? You're an hour away from London, half an hour, 45 minutes away from Manchester, an hour from Birmingham. Do you think this is an SFA thing then? Yes, I do. I think, um, it's all my opinion, but I, I think that the SFA were afraid to give Graham the job because Graham's very much his own man and yeah. does his own thing, and mm -hmm. I don't think they could handle him. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. But just, just before I go, Bill, what, what do you think of this whole thing about James McCarthy thing? Well, this young boy. I, well, I looked after him, you know that, don't you? Yeah, but I think this is a disgrace. This, this guy's getting, he's getting slaughtered on the, on the network, no, papers, but radio stations, phone-ins, it's what, this poor guy. I spoke to him before he, he went decided to play for the Republic of Ireland. And it was a decision, a decision that he wanted to do. And uh, I must admit, I backed him 100% because uh, the, there was no interest from Scotland whatsoever. We spoke to various people at the time and told them about the sort of breakthrough that, that he, was, he was having. And uh, nobody took it upon us. The very fact that his, his grandfather and that came from Donegal and the whole bit yeah. had a big influence on the boy. And mm -hmm. I think people should leave him alone. He's made his decision. And I, th I think we should all be th thankful that he made a decision so young in life, and, and just applaud him for what he's done. Yeah, what, why I bring this up, because you know, as you know yourself, Rangers are playing Hamilton this weekend. Yes, yes. And the, I don't want to see any problems here with, on, with Laddie, you know what I mean? Well, I've got to tell you one thing. Rangers tried to sign him um, about a year back. Oh. Yes, they tried to sign him. Uh, it didn't happen, uh, as Celtic did at the same time. Both Celtic and Rangers were interested, and uh, the boy chose at that stage to stay with Hamilton for another year, a couple of years. Um, but can you imagine a young boy, 16, 17 year old, signing for Rangers, playing for the Republic of Ireland, which he chose to play for them rather than Scotland? Well, you have broke new ground with Morris Johnson. Maybe you could do the same thing with James McCarthy then. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? There, really? there you go, Billy. That's you. Had your time. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Billy. Thank Thank you. Thanks, All the best. Cheers now. Thank you. Do. There we go. Excellent stuff. Now, I've got Bill McMurdo in the studio with me only for another couple of minutes. Uh, you're live on Scottish phone, and who's that? Hi Scotty, Baboon Bum here. Baboon Bum, how are you doing? Would you like Hi, to speak Scotty. to Bill McMurdo? I sure would, yes. Good piss on. Hello Bill, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks. And you? Ah, fine, fine, fine. Good. Bill, how do you see the way Paul Gascoigne's going just now in comparison to George Best? I think uh, they're very, very, very similar, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I, I've known Paul since he was 16 years old and he's always had problems. Um, a lot of people would say psychiatric problems. He, he does uh, have massive problems with drink and things like that and, and I think there are so many similarities between him and George and um, that it upsets me to see him. 
Is it the addictive nature that he takes over, do you think? Yes, yes. It's totally addictive. Everything that he does uh, is, is self an addictive nature, and he, he's just he's just lost the place completely, which is unfortunate because he's a nice guy. He's like George, very, very modest guy, lovely guy uh, to socialise with and to know, but he's in a bad, bad state. I've met him quite a few times to aye. come to cross that way. Aye, lovely. Yeah, I used to live in a wee village called Cobarkin. Yeah, of course, aye. I used to go, and when we was at Loch Lomond, you know, at the... Cameron House. I used to go up there most weekends when he was here. That's right. Lovely guy, but uh, he's, he's hit the slippery slope. There's no doubt about that. Big time. Aye. Lovely, lovely to hear you, Baboon Bum. Thanks, Scotty. Thanks very much, bud. Right, uh, time is uh, very, very tight. We'll see if we can get in as many calls as possible. Hello, you're through to Scotty's phone in. Who's that? A dinky do. A dinky do. Now there's uh, Brendan in the county, Derry. Yeah. Would you like to speak to Bill McMurdo? I'll have a wee word with him. There you are, Bill. This, this is Brendan from London, Derry. How are you, Brendan? Hello, Bill. How are you? Are you well? Uh, uh, yeah, fine, thanks. That's yep. good, that's good. Now, um, it's, 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 it's interesting you mentioned Ireland there. I'd be on the opposite side of the fence to you. Right. I'd be an Irish nationalist. Right, OK. <laughs> and um, I don't agree when if you say it, it, it could start at any time. I don't think it will, you know. I think it's got beyond that now with the decommissioning and one thing or another. I think it's got beyond that now. Yes. I don't think it'll ever be as bad again as it was. I know there's a few dissidents out there, but yes. I don't think it'll ever be as bad as what it was. Uh, God forbid, I don't think it will be. I, I agree with you. I just think that it, it could resurrect at any time, but like you, I'm hoping it doesn't, because Northern Ireland is a tremendous place uh, from both sides. I've had some great, great okay. times over mm-hmm. there, you know. And, uh, yeah, it's great to go over there and know that you're safe and that everyone's enjoying themselves and uh, fantastic. More people should go over there and enjoy Northern Ireland. OK, I mean, a lot of people do come over now. There's a lot more come over here now than did whenever the troubles were yes. at their height. Yes. And um, I, just hope it, I, 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 um, I just hope it continues for a lot longer, and I think it will, as I say, because I think a lot of people... Even though there's still a wee bit of sectarianism there, I think a lot of people have moved on. That yes. politicians are speaking to each other now as well. That's a breakthrough, isn't it? Oh yeah, it certainly a is. Massive breakthrough, yeah. Fantastic, Brendan. Lovely to hear you, and we'll catch up later. All the best, Brendan. Okay, thank you. Hey, hey thank you, do now. Okay. Okay, bye bye. There we go. That's Brendan from the County Derry, of course. And uh, I've got Bill McMurdo in the studio with you now. Your calls are uh, quite overwhelming. We could probably keep them all day, but I can't take any more calls because uh, uh, we're, we're on a strict uh, a strict embargo. 11 o'clock, and then that is it because Bill has to press on. Bill, um, you're, I mean, you're welcome in any clubs, regardless of race, creed, or colour. You know, I mean, you, you know, it's it's it's. Well, I know that that you can walk into any boardroom of any club and be given one of the warmest welcomes under the sun, and that's not uh, at your stage in the game just a commercial thing or anything like that. I mean, obviously, people have got uh, commercial interests, but but Bill McMurdo himself mm-hmm. is welcome in any of the. You, you you yourself are not really a sectarian man. No. You're, you're, you're a harmonious man. You've yeah. brought divides closer over the peace. Yes, I, I don't think I'm sectarian. I have very, very strong views on my religion and my politics, um, but I'm not sectarian, I don't think, and I'm certainly not bigoted. I don't D- think I am. You're not, I don't think you're bigoted at all. Can you see the day when um, when Celtic Rangers will stand together, the supporters will stand together at Old Firm Games? I don't think it's going to be in my lifetime. Really? No, I don't. Um, but... The very fact that they're now singing at each other as opposed to fighting with each other and yeah. throwing things at each other, I think that's a step in the right direction. It's never really bothered me about the, the singing from either side, I mean. Singing, singing, isn't singing, it? Aye, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not. And I mean, words are words, aye, you know, aye, uh, sticks and stones. Aye, I mean, I, I don't understand why people got upset about that. Yes. You know what I mean? It's, do you think it's something, do you think maybe the politicians are trying to ride on a bandwagon rather than actually uh, sort out genuine sectarianism? Well, I think there's there's a lot a lot to that. I think that a lot of them um, tie their coat to that tail, you know, mm. and say, yes, we want to be seen to be doing this or doing that or doing the next thing. But at the same time, they're really doing nothing. There's, there's nothing, all this no by mouth and all that. It just, but you're only going to drive it underground so people are muttering in street aye, corners, aren't aye, we? Aye. Really? Yes. I just think that the more that, that um, Protestants and Catholics come together socially, the less um, upset you're going to have. 
because once you get to know people, it doesn't matter whether they're white, black, people, you know, are people. people are people. And, and that's why I keep going back to the school thing. 